throw my stuff away, I just put it to the side. So you can either put it up there or there's going to be an empty bed behind you. So you just put your um, suction stuff away and then you're going to have your suction, your tray chair kit stuff out. Still check all day, uh, you're going to have an assigned time, but we're also doing blood pressure and atrial pulse. So you'll be here from 8.30, promptly, on time, until 2.30, okay? So, and we're rotating through because you might be over here in this room doing your blood pressure and atrial pulse, uh, but then you have to get your trach suction done at 10.15. So uh, there will be a schedule for that, and we'll talk about that at 8.30, I'll check all day. So you'll be ready to do both skills, okay? And uh, this is going to take about 15 minutes, 30 days. Um, and there's usually not a problem with the 30 minutes. People just put their stuff to the side and then they start their next skill. Just to let you know, I would because I know it doesn't it doesn't seem and right now feel like a lot of time, but I was practicing with a student from the other class yesterday, and she asked me to time her doing both skills, and she got done in 20 minutes doing both skills. She even stopped and asked questions and no he was not rushed he was doing it at a you know a leisurely mm -hmm. pace I know it feels like forever when you're doing it but as of yesterday she had plenty of time to get through those skills okay all right well let's get this party started so you practice you guys are anxious to hear what I can tell all right um so we're going to talk about trade chair now are you ready I'm going you're going you're not going to post all that on, you're going to edit it, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, tracheostomy care. So uh, in the real world, you're going to suction your patient first to clear out their airway, and then you're going to perform trach care. So that's how you're going to do it in check off. But now I want to talk more about the trach and what it is exactly that we're caring for, okay? So this is still 13 to 19 in your um, skills textbook. And uh, just some medical terminology words, just to go over. A stoma is any abnormal opening in the body. So you can have a, a, a GI stoma. You can have a trach stoma, okay? Um, so the surgeon will, will cut an opening in the patient's um, neck to access the trach. And this is on page nine of your packet. Tracheostomy care. So when we put an artificial airway in um, the opening, it's called a tracheostomy. Trach, okay? And um, so we're actually going to clean out that trachea, which we're going to talk about. Now, the trach cannot come out because then our patient would be at risk for, um, what is that? That's that name. What is that nursing diagnosis triggered to the airway? Not the clearance. It's having an open and patent airway. I'm trying to remember what it is. Anyway. Uh, all right. So let's talk about the, um, again, we would need a prescriber's order to do trach care. Typically, it's done every shift, so you need to figure out if that's every eight hours or every 12 hours. You can work collaboratively with respiratory therapy if the, you know, maybe you guys can do it together if they're going to do it, you want to watch them or whatnot. Um, but the purpose of trach care is to clean the secretions on the inside, and we need to clean the stoma around the trach, okay, because we've got a, a surgical incision there, and we need to clean it and assess it and document. So uh, any accumulation of secretions can affect airway clearance. There's actually a trach dressing there. It has a little dressing. It's a split sponge or a split sponge. It's basically just a four by four with a split in it. So we're going to replace that. We're going to take the old off. It's going to have a lot of mucus. It's going to be wet. And we're going to clean the stomach and we're going to put a dressing back on. You can't just use any split sponge or drain sponge. So you have to make sure it's a trait kind. And we can't cut a four by four because those loose cotton fibers will be after it through the trait. So it has to be a specific drain sponge for a trait. 
Um, so let me talk about the different parts of the fruit. And I know you guys are very curious. So when we have um, when we have a trach, okay, this is the part that you see on the outside. This is the flange that goes right next to the patient's skin. This is the part that's on the inside of the patient. Okay. When we do trach hair, we're going to take out the inner cannula and clean it and peroxide and put it back in. So this is all left here. The patient's airway is still maintained and open with this trach. We're going to clean this inner cannula and put it back in. When the surgeon first puts a trach in, sometimes he will secure it to the skin with sutures. So not only will we have to assess the spermicide, but we'll have to assess where it's sewn to the neck. Okay. Now this is painful when it's first done. As the patients have it, they get more comfortable with it, it's not as painful. Okay, I'm sure the guy does, he's walking down the street and he'll be a little soft. <laughs> so you have to be very cognizant of that. Sometimes patients might need to be medicated before you do trach care. You're going to tell them with pain medicine. You're going to tell them it might be tender, but it's going to get better. Every day it's going to get better. Okay. And if they see those smoking commercials and they've got a thing in their face, they'll say two shower and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, and now with the baseball players chewing again, now we're starting to see more of it again. Anyway, um, the squirrel. Um, so, there's an outer cannula, inner cannula, face plate, and then sometimes there's an obturator. They come in different sizes, which I already mentioned. The sizes are right here, and this is actually a six. The one that's in my mannequin is an eight, uh, and this one is actually a four. So this would be a pediatric trait. See how small that is? And lots of patients, a lot of people that are doing home health and peds patients are caring for patients with traits. Okay. Um, so the smaller the number, the smaller size. Four, and I think this one is a eight. Okay, so you just size the airway. Um, now, you'll notice that these all have different little gadgets. The first thing I want to talk about is the inner cannula. We basically have two kinds of inner cannulas here. We have this one that has blue dots. This one is non-disposable. That means we don't throw it away. This one is non-disposable. The one with the blue dots is non-disposable. Okay. We also have disposable inner cannulas. They have little wings on them. Okay. Um, in the real world, if the facility had the right size inner cannula, we would take out the inner cannula and put a new one in using sterile technique. So I would take this out, throw it away, and I have a sterile, um, this is my six French inner cannula, uh, my six French disposable. Okay. Put on my sterile gloves, open this up, take this out, and plop it in here. And my sterile procedure is done, and then I'm going to clean the stoma and the site around it. But we are fiscally responsible, and we are going to actually because we're our supplies, we're out of supplies. Okay. Um, we're going to clean either one of these and put it back in. Okay. So, because we're pretty sure, we're also pretty confident that you guys, if it was truly disposable, we're pretty confident if you know how to clean one, you could take one out if it was truly disposable, throw it away, and open a new package to get everything in. So we're pretty sure you can do that without being tested. talk about that next. Okay. So, because you don't know which kind of trait you're going to have on checkoff day, you have to make sure that you lock them both appropriately. The blue dots get lined up and you have to make sure it's clicked and locked. Okay. Because if it's not locked and the patient coughs, it's going to fly out. Mm -hmm. Alright. So you have to make sure that you know how to lock it and unlock it and make sure it's secure. Okay. The disposable one has two clips on both sides. And again, you have to pinch it. Sometimes people will only clip one side and not the other. Or if you don't clip it at all, patient coughs again, flies out. All right? 
So know how to do the pinky wings on both sides or the blue, um, and it says which way is blocked. Um, now, the other difference that you notice, this one has a um, balloon hanging from it, and this one does not. So you're only going to see this outside, depending on which trach it is. So if you see this hanging out, then you know this balloon is on the inside. And this balloon is going to be inflated to keep that in the trachea so it doesn't fly out. Respiratory therapy manages all of that. All right. So we want to make sure we don't cut this. Okay, and we can't really manipulate this out of the trachea. So this is a cuff trach. Yes? Yeah. What if you walk in and the animal has one of those in the air that is not going to take this out of respiratory? Yes, absolutely. So her question was, what do you what do you do if you're assessing your patient and you notice this is flat or not inflated? Would you call somebody? It might be respiratory therapy, and I'm going to get back to that in one more second. Let me finish in a second. So this one's cuffed with a balloon. This one is not cuffed. Okay. We also work with speech therapy and occupational therapy. They will tell us what kind of patient, what kind of trait our patient needs, and whether they can eat or speak or whatnot. All right. So um, sometimes they might have a cuff trait, but cuff trait. But the doctor's order or speech therapy will say that the cuff is deflated because we're trying to get them to speak and eat. So again, that's a, a prescriber's order. All right. Um, the other difference is this one has holes in it. Why do you think, what would happen, what would be the benefit of having holes in your trach compared to these? Think about the anatomy. Right. Trach, and with this kind of trach, can force air up through their larynx this way, and they can speak. No, you may need to tap it. It goes in progressive steps, and that's where we work with speech therapy. Depends on how much strength they have behind that. Okay. So that's why we work collaboratively with all these other disciplines to care for patients like this. And when something has a hole, it's called what? That's an artificial hole. When equipment, when so this is a fenestrated trait because they have holes. And you're going to hear that word again next week. I don't want to test you on it. It's not really the best time. All right. Um, so a fenestrated trait, patient might be able to eat or speak. Okay. So all of that, you have to be cognizant of what kind of trait your patient has because it depends on the nursing care and the expectation. Not so basically you can't say not all patients can't speak or eat, right? That's not true. It just depends. Our favorite answer, it depends. Right. It depends. That's where that clinical reasoning comes into play. That's where we're trying to get you guys to think about. You have to know the anatomy. You have to know what kind of equipment we're dealing with. You have to know the situation. Yes, Dr. Um, um well most patients if I'm in the hospital, I would say yes, but if I'm in uh, Milton, I'd say no. And he, <laughs> he, might have had, he might have had these issues. No, no reason he couldn't walk down the street with a trach and go home and do his pediatric eating. Right. So um, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm understanding. If there's a balloon, it's fenestrated. No, the balloon has to do with the cuff. Okay. It's a cuff trach. Because this cuff trach is fenestrated and this cuff trach is not. And I'm going to pass these around so you guys can see them. Okay? Um, let's see. There's also metal trach. Um, and the um, Ambu bag or um, would attach right here to this inner cranial. And there's also other kinds of trach. There's nice pictures in your book of a cap trach and, and lovely books. All right, so let's see. Can I clean my metal, the metal trach the same as I clean the plastic one? No, Miss Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had. I've never seen a metal. Wheeler said there are no metal traits. Miss Fleetwood and I said, oh, yes, there's still a metal trait. No, I see. I, have all I love nursing because I learn something every single day, and either I forgot it because it was when I was a dinosaur, or <laughs> I haven't seen it in my practice. But metal traits. 
You can't use peroxide to clean metal plates because they stain. I've not seen metal plates, but apparently there's a dinosaur in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, military used to use metal plates, huh? What's the advantage of metal? They're old or plastic. Okay. Advances in plastic. So on Monday, they all call me old. Probably by now, I'm sure that those metal plates are safe from peroxide, I would guess. And you can't pour peroxide in a metal bowl with that in there. All right, so I'm going to pass these. Um, please stay in. So I'm going to pass these four tricks around to see the differences and play with them and see what's on the inside and what's on the outside. All right. Um, so in order to keep this procedure safe, we have to make sure that we're using sterile techniques. Okay? We have to keep the airway clean. And um, we have to make sure that the crate doesn't fly out. So a lot of the things, locking it, keeping the power on, we're going to talk about um, so that the crate doesn't fly out with things that are compromised. Because so if the crate flies out, we don't have an open airway. Okay, so that's the answer. Yes. There, um, if you say OD and ID, it's an outside diameter and inside diameter. Okay, but above that says transparent, and I'm just trying to make sure that wasn't transparent. No, I think it's fenestrated, right? Is that yeah. a fenestrated crate? Yeah. Okay. So this says um, 6 DIC, so I think that's inter, um, internal diameter. Okay. All right. Um, so. Um, secretions that are around can cause maceration of the skin, so we want to make sure that dries. So we would typically do crepe care every shift, but if they have a lot of secretions, the dressing gets wet, we have to keep our patient dry. So we would do crepe care as needed, PRN. Um, we're going to assess, again, we're going to assess our patient before, and we're going to assess our patient after. This time, the crepe can actually get massaged, so we are going to listen after and all six lung seals anteriorly, posteriorly, make sure the crepe is intact, okay? Um, we're assessing for drainage. So I think I'm going to start the procedure now. So let's go to page, where is the procedure? This section, this here. Page 11. <coughs> Again, we're going to explain the procedure to the patient. We need to let them know, are we just changing the dressing, the changing the collar, changing the inside. If I already did crepe care at 10 a.m. and things are foiled by noon, I probably don't have to clean the inside, but I just need to clean the um, crepe dressing and the collar, okay? So you're going to explain to the patient what you're going to do, all right? Um, can crepe care be uh, delegated to a CNA? Can it be delegated to an LPN? Yes. yes, we can, because they have a license as well. Okay. As the RN, we're going to assess our aides and our LPNs to make sure that they're doing the procedure properly and safely. Okay. Um, but you know, you're not too quick there. I'm talking about that. All right. So I'm going to explain the procedure to the patient. I'm going to make sure that he's positioned properly. I'm going to. Um, uh, obtain my supplies. Now, if I came into my patient's room and I see a pack of cake trick here, I would wash my hands before I got started. Okay? I get side my patient, provide privacy, explain the explain what part of the procedure I'm going to do, make sure I provide safety at all times. For check all, you guys are going to be assessing the patient, and you're going to put your supplies, and do I need to identify my patient again? No, because I'm still here with my same patient. I don't think she's 
jumped out of bed and immediately she jumped in there. <laughs> okay? Then, so then she stayed right there just to establish the life. Yeah. So when we go from one skill to the next, you know, we always want you to wash your hands, identify your patient before all procedures, but this is the same patient, right? Now, do you think I need to wash my hands after I suction before I do trach hair? Yes. yes. And why is that? Because I took my gloves off and I'm getting ready to get sterile again. So you always wash your hands before you put your, um, when you put your gloves on, before you put your gloves on. Okay. Um, and I'm going to keep alcohol in my pocket, rubbing alcohol. Okay. But again, remember I can't use that in certain situations. Can't use it before and after eating. I can't use it before and after going to the bathroom. That's kind of what happened here. Um, but if my patient had two lips, and let's say I pull his hand out and he's got stool on his hands because he's been itching his rear end, okay, then I'm going to have to go wash my hands in the sink. I can't use my alcohol, right? Okay, because he's got two lips. So uh, we're going to be thinking about those things. So all procedures, I'm going to do my wipes. You saw me wash my hands, so I wash my hands, okay? This is still Mrs. Bonebreaker. I provided privacy, okay? Um, because we don't uh, want people to see what we're doing. We want to um, keep our patient's privacy intact. I've explained the procedure to the patient and I'm providing safety at all times. Before I do trach hair, I would suction. Right, but we've already done that. I'm going to properly position my patient. He's still in semi phallus position. I'm still going to leave the pillow out so that I can access his trach without touching his skin. Um, again, I don't need to raise the bed for me because this is working level. And I've got a towel here in case he um, expectorates some mucus while I'm manipulating his trach. And I'm going to put my side rail down so that I can access him uh, more comfortably without hurting my back. Now the supplies that I need in my kit, I have, uh, and all the kits are differently different, so you need to read it, but for this, uh, we have our sterile basins here. We're going to pour fluids in these solutions, in these basins. Um, we have six inch cotton applicators, known as long C-cups in here. I have a trach sponge in here. I have four by four gauze. I have pipe cleaners and I have a brush. And I have my sterile gloves. Some kids don't have sterile gloves, so you have to bring your sterile gloves with you. Okay. Or if you contaminate a lot, you have extra pair of sterile gloves in your pocket or bring a couple extra. Um, with the trach suctioning procedure, um, I always want to make sure that I have a sterile suction kit left at the base bedside. Because I wouldn't want my patient to develop respiratory distress and then I'd have to leave to go get suction supplies. So there's always a spare trach kit at the bedside, or suction kit and usually a spare trait as well. So I've gathered my supplies. The other thing that's not in my kit that I need for today is a trait collar, because I'm going to change that. So what I need is my kids' kit. And these are usually in a sterile package, but we're reusing it, not sterile, but it's in a package. So I need my trait cleaning kit, my trait collar, a bottle of saline, same bottle of saline that we use for our suctioning, Okay, and a bottle of peroxide. Um, so again, I'm going to open my kit using sterile technique. All right, this is perforated here. I'm going to peel this back, and I can only touch the outside. I can't touch anything in here because that would compromise my sterile seal. Right. Um, now I need my gloves that are there and my sterile drape. I'm going to reach in and pull my gloves out without touching anything else. So I'm going to pinch, okay? Only touching my sterile gloves. I'm going to bring those out. Again, I'm on the patient's left side because I'm left-handed. And there's my sterile drape. I need to pull my sterile drape, create my sterile seal without contaminating anything. There's two sides to the sterile drape. There's a shiny side, which goes down because that's the water resistant barrier. So shiny side down, and um, I'm going to show you how to do that. Now, in the real world, you would tear it off your lid and get that, rid of that, but we have to remove it, all right? So um, you can make sure.
here today we're doing 100% cross side in the first beam segment, okay? Um, and then I'm going to pour my saline. I'm going to fill my basin up with about an inch, okay? So like Miss Kendall said, I could put them here. Can I go like that? Yeah. Very good. Okay, can I go like that? Yeah. Big exaggerated movement. I'm going to put my cross side there. So I know I got my cross side there and my saline there. So that's going to obstruct the view. So I'm going to get these out of the viewing. Here, see that? Not turning my back. I'm keeping in front of me, putting my basin back there. Because I still need to put my gloves on. Um, I'm going to move this a little bit closer here. Okay. Before I get sterile, I'm still not sterile. My gloves are still here. Okay. This is my spare tank time, this is my fail. I have to do three things before I go sterile. I have to pour my solution, okay? And I have to get out my inner cannula. So I now need to put my gloves on, right? So I've got my uh, gloves back here. These are my clean gloves to protect me. And first thing I'm going to do is take out that inner cannula. So I'm going to move this off to the side. And this is the cookie pine. So I'm going to unclip both sides. This might be a little tender, so I'm going to make sure that I don't pull on this trace. I'm going to hold that face plate. I'm going to pull this out gently and slowly. There's my inner cannula. Okay. And I'm going to put this in my cross side. Now, I'm only going to touch the part that's on the outside of the patient. I'm never, ever going to touch what's inside that's in this tracheal. I'm only touching the outside. I'm going to dump that into my cross side. Back on flight back again. You must know every time I'm going to go sterile. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I need to change that dirty trach sponge. So I'm going to pull this out underneath because the split part is on top. I'm trying to do it so you can see. So here's my trach sponge. Okay. I'm going to assess the drainage. I'm going to look to see how much is there, how wet it is. Okay. I'm going to look at his stoma and assess it, looking for redness, drainage. Is it sealing well? Is it open? Is it got any pressure ulcers? Okay. Now I'm going to dispose of my dirty dressing inside my gloves again. Just Can I just flatten down and apply the um, yeah, it's actually, yeah. Let me get rid of this first and then I'll do that. Um, so again, I'm going to put this inside my glove. Okay. And I'm going to take my gloves off. And I'm going to put it in the trash can. Okay. Um, let me fix this. I'll go ahead and talk about this. Um, I need to talk about the elastic around these neck real quick. All right. Because I keep seeing my patients getting at risk for um, alterations in skin integrity. I'm going to take this off. Now, I'm monitoring his pulse ox. His pulse ox is still 97, 98 since I suctioned him. I just had to get that stuff out. This is elastic. Okay? Sometimes patients will pull on this or healthcare providers will pull on this to create, you know, skin integrity issues behind the neck. So I need to assess the back of his neck. This has two sides. This side stays snapped, and the only reason that I would need to unsnap this is um, sometimes I have to clean the mask. This is the snappy side. This side is adjustable, and it's supposed to be freely adjustable. It's not supposed to be knotted up. It's not supposed to be um, torn here, or else it doesn't work. Okay, because yesterday I had my patient sitting up in the hallway and their masks were falling down. So I had to tighten this so the mask would stay up there so they wouldn't get out of breath while they were sitting in the hallway. Okay. Um, now I'm going to be, you see me moving the mask back and forth. So I need to make sure that I loosen this, and I'm trying to do it, loosen this up so that I can move the mask back and forth. If he's very oxygen dependent, I want to make sure it stays up there. If he's uh, only on 24%, doesn't need much oxygen, I'm going to keep it there. Okay. So that is how the oxygen mask works. Okay, good, did you see that? All right, so I've assessed his skin. 
Now, I've done my three things. I have poured my solution, taken out the inner cannula, it's soaking in on top side, it's bubbling, it's cleaning, it's, you know, scrubbing bubbles, okay? And um, I've taken out my drain sponge. Now I'm ready to get sterile. Let me try to move this closer to me. Now, I also have my overbed table properly positioned. I can use my foot to move my table. That's why nurses love these overbed tables. You learn how to work it around the break, around the wheels. I can move it to me. All right. Now my gloves are here. These gloves, this package is sterile gloves, and it tells me where my left glove is and where my right is and where the cuff end is. Cuff end. All right. So I'm going to make sure the cuff end is here. I'm going over to the edge of my table. Okay, because I can't open my glove onto my sterile field, right? So I'm going to make sure it doesn't overlap. So I'm going to go down here. Uh, I'm going to put, how do I put my first glove on? Pinch. 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 Very good. So I'm going to pinch my glove. And when you reach out your glove, put them thumbed out. Your thumb. See my thumb? So I'm going to put my first glove on, pinching. And my second glove. My thumb there? Where's my thumb supposed to be? Out. Out. Very good. Don't want it to get in trouble. Where's my thumb? There it is. Miss Wheeler, do I need to <coughs> wash my hands between taking that dirty dressing out and putting my sterile gloves on? Great question.
That one's a little bit close, so I probably cannot use that Q-tip because it, it fell out of my, when I dropped my contacts. Okay. Yesterday, somebody fell out, and they're like, okay, what would you do? Can you use that one? So I am not going to use that Q-tip. I'm going to slide them over there. I have my two pipe cleaners here for drying. I have three Q-tips left. Good thing cotton out here. Here's my brush. Now it would have been much easier if she had remembered to separate these things before she picked up that inner cannula so she could have used both hands because she had touch things again. These are my sea strings. These are all, this is also called silky. This is what you may see for your patient when they first come back from the surgeon. They might use scroll cases to show them too. We are using a foam, more comfortable tape collar. So I don't need this scroll tape. I can just move it out of the way and put it on my glove paper if I want. Okay. Um, I have my Craig sponge here. I'm going to put that up here out of my field. And I still, and I have three um, scroll back boards. Okay. So I've separated my supplies. All right, I'm going to pick up my uh, brush here. I'm going to get it wet into the peroxide. And I need to be careful because my arms are in my field. Oh, now I got water on my field. Like three. <laughs> Am I still at the English table? that my inner cannula is clean. Now I need to get rid of my brush. I'm going to go over my sterile field. I've got a couple of choices. I can use my glove paper or I can put it in that section that's not being used. But if I put it in the section that's not being used, I gotta go around like that. Okay? Or you can lay it in my section. Yeah, I could. Yeah. Oh, I saw that one. See, there's ten ways to skin a cat. I'm always looking. Uh, you could hold the traction if it's close enough. You have to be careful moving around too much and tossing stuff with your sterile field. All right, so now I'm rinsing it in my saline because I have to get all that peroxide off. Again, I'm only holding the part that's on the outside. So rinsey, rinsey, tappy, tappy, any extra saline, okay? If I wanted to, I could tap it on the gauze just to make sure extra, all right? Um, I do want to keep some of this lubricant on the outside. I don't have to clean the outside with gauze. I'm basically getting the liquid out from the inside so my patient doesn't choke, but it's still kind of lubricated so it'll slide in. Now I'm going to put it into my patient, all right? So when I slide this in, I need to either be at the 3 o'clock position or the 9 o'clock position because that's the natural curvature of the trach, all right? So, um, which is very similar. Uh, you may be talking, I don't know if you talked about oropharyngeal airways yesterday or um, nasopharyngeal airways and there's, there's the yellow stroke in the silk book. But you have to position things in so the tubes go in better. So I'm going to slide this. I'm at the three o'clock position. Yes. Did you use the gauze? I tapped it. It really, yeah. Not much space in there. If I needed to, I could use my pipe cleaner. Yeah, you could use the pipe cleaner because you need to clean the inside. The outside doesn't matter. It's a trade one, so it's. Oh, it's a trade brush. Okay. Yeah. Um, Yesterday when we did it in the lab, for some reason the fluid was staying inside. So I was needing more shoot and getting the fluid out. For some reason today there's nothing inside there. So I was going to put it in. If I needed to dry it, I would use my pipe cleaner. So I can use my pipe cleaner. And yesterday, um, all we had to do is just stick it under here and it got that extra water bubble, saline bubble out. Okay. But I can use the inner cannula, I can use the pipe cleaner to clean the um, 
inside. Okay. But the outside, I want to remove it for you. That's okay. All right. So now I'm going to go back and put this in. I'm going to slide it in, and I'm starting at three o'clock position, and I'm going down to the uh, six o'clock position. Okay. And I need to snap it. Left side, right side. All right. Now this hand is dirty. This hand is still sterile and clean, and I've kept it up here in front of me. All right. Now I can. Because this is a surgical incision, I want to make sure that I'm cleaning with a clean hand, sterile hand. Right. So um, I'm only I'm down to three Q-tips now. So I'm going to wet my Q-tip in the saline, and I'm going to clean his stoma in about two to four inches around the stoma. I have to start at the surgical site and work out. So you clean with the saline, not the cloth. Yes, clean the saline. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to start, and uh, thankfully his looks pretty good. I'm going to start the stoma. I'm going to start the stomacite and work out. Now my little cord is here, so I need to move that out of the way. Okay. Cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. Cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. Okay. Um, I'm going to dispose of this either on my glove paper or in my basin. Saline. This time I did the two for one special. Uh, I got both of them, and I'm going to clean the top. So I'm cleaning the stoma site now. I see on top it looks a little really great there. Cleaning the stoma site two to four inches around. So at the two o'clock position, I see some redness there. Now I'm going to get this side. That looks good. If he has sutures, I want to be careful. I want to be assessing the suture site. Okay. Now I'm going to. Um, oh, I missed some music there. I'm going to use one of these. Four by fours. Uh, I need to get all that blood and mucus off of him. So I'm going to dab that in my saline. I'm going to clean this. Make sure. Oh, that wasn't. That was just dye. It was faded dye. That wasn't redness. Okay. And then I'm going to dry his neck with my last four by four. So I'm drying, drying. epidermis on my hand. Okay. Um, and I'm going to slide this underneath of this tree. I'm going to lift this tree collar up because that tree will be very sensitive. Slide that under there. Okay. And I'm going to come over here, lift up that tree collar. Can you see? And fix his little bow tie nice and pretty. Okay. So the sale part is done, but I can still keep these gloves on. The last thing I need to do is change the tray collar. We have two different kinds of tray collars. We have this plain white one that is one size fits all. And we have, he actually is wearing a blue one, which is an adjustable one. Right? We always start on the distal end first. So these both have Velcro. So I want to make sure that the um, sticky part is up. And when I put the collar on, I have to go underneath the tying. It's kind of tricky.
also is on the outside of the hotel and not seen by our bus. And why do you think we don't take the old car off the Right, because if you're manipulating it or they cough and that old collar's off, what's going to happen to that tray? It's going to come out. It's going to come out. And he's not going to be happy. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody's going to get sick. Okay, so I have the new collar on. Now I can take the old collar off. Okay? Because if I'm putting the new collar and I don't have the old collar, the paper cloth, I've compromised the airway. All right? So I'm going to take the old collar off. Again, this is just Velcro. Slide that out. Check the back of his neck. Make sure there's no redness or drainage. Make sure it's dry. And in the real world, I would dispose of this, but we can leave you with our supplies. And then I need to check to see how tight it is. Now, this is pretty loose. You should only be able to get one to two fingers underneath that. Because if the patient coughs, that tray's going to come out. Okay, then you have to call somebody um, more experienced than us to put that back in. So I'm going to secure this a little bit tighter. I'm going to use this guy. Tighten that up. All right, so I can get one or two fingers there. And I'm going to put this oxygen, the elastic, tight on those muscles then. Get that loose. The saturation is like 95%. All right, so I've changed, I've cleaned the stoma, I changed the dressing, it has a little bow tie on, it looks good, and I changed the collar. So I'm done with my take care. I'm going to assess my patient again, pulse ox, respiratory status, lung sound. I'm going to document what I assess with his dressing change, and um, something else I was just talking about. All right, so. No, I need to um, get put a towel away. Clean this trash up. Yes. Or my aide's going to tell me about it. <laughs> and while you're practicing, just know that the caps you have will dispense sterile, saline, and peroxide. You still have your bottle. Yeah, they're getting a little <laughs> 